wiring up a transfer switch on this off-grid house. It's actually a, a grid tied house, and uh, the you know kind of what we were talking about it yesterday in Mississippi. It's best not to interconnect the systems, and so we have a transfer switch on the side of the house. The concern is it's it's a large lake house, and it's um you know they have two hot water tanks and a hot tub and an electric sauna. And there's only two people living there, but the concern is when the whole family shows up for the holidays, you know, is 12 kilowatts going to be, you know, enough power? And, you know, the electric service panel is a, a 200 amp service at 240 volts. And so, you know, times multiply that together to get your power, you know, that's 48 kilowatts, which is plenty of power for them. But our inverter is only 12 kilowatts with a 20 second, 36 kilowatt burst. So for like cranking on the compressor. And so what we're doing is we're wiring up a transfer switch so that when they do have a full house of guests, they can just swap over to grid only and get that full service panel rating. And then, uh, but most of the time, they'll be switched over into a, a kind of an off grid mode but we have a full day today so let's just go ahead and jump in um we were talking about battery AR. maintenance AR. yeah um i'm not sure if you noticed or not or if you want to answer it right away but uh, someone did write in a question okay so i just wanted to let you know yeah sounds good um yeah the question is what happens to stranded energy and the the answer is it just it, it acts like open circuit voltage. It just, the, the panel voltage is slightly elevated and and it just stays up in the modules as potential, like a, a battery that is not connected to anything. And as soon as there's a load for it, it goes in, but it doesn't hurt the system. Um, so, so with what we're doing here in these pictures is measuring the specific gravity of the battery, which is the only real way to determine the state of charge of the battery. Measuring the voltage, uh, if you remember yesterday, is kind of like a, an S-curve. And so, you know, you really don't know what's going on with the battery unless it's fully topped off or fully discharged. The, the middle part is kind of a mystery by just measuring the voltage. Uh, the specific gravity can give you exactly the state of charge. And what it's, it's primarily used for is to diagnose bad uh, cells inside the battery. So you can kind of make it out. There's a little circle here and a little circle here, a little circle here, a little circle here. These are all individual sections of the battery called cells. And if, if one cell has a specific gravity that is off compared to the others, uh, that, that cell is going bad. Uh, and there's not much you can do about it at that point. Although, you know, with, uh, with the unsealed lead acid, you can apply a higher voltage to them and do some conditioning um, before you to, to mitigate and prevent cell degradation. Um, Okay, so moving on, let's just talk about some, we kind of talked about the nuances. There's a, there's a huge cost difference between uh, stackable inverters that you can just keep adding more for power uh, that are also rated to be grid connected and backflowing versus getting kind of all in one units that, um, you know, I, I, they're, they're cheaper because they're not designed for the grid connection. They're not designed to be stackable. They're only designed to be one way. And, you know, the cost difference between a, a stackable battery inverter, which are your like big names and battery inverters, which are like Outback and Schneider, SMA uh, and Magnum. Um, those are all much more expensive than, you know, the, the companies like, you know, Ames and Victron that are not designed to backfeed the grid. So that's kind of a, a strategy we use in Mississippi to get our costs down uh, is opting for a big all-in-one inverter rather than something that is, uh, 
you know, a little bit more elegant. You know, a nice thing about these all-in-one inverters is, say, with the, the Schneider system, you have to buy an extra component and wire it up that, that'll go and start the generator, whereas, like, Ames, the, the auto generator is already built into it. You know, here is a, a transfer switch that is external to the, the Schneider system. You know, again, because it's designed to be stackable, there's a lot of external parts that you then, you know, add on to it. Whereas an all-in-one unit, you know, that, that transfer switch is already built into it. And so, um, so there, when I say not UL listed, I mean it's not UL listed for grid interconnection. Um, you know, sometimes all the switches that are inside an all-in-one unit, you still might have to add a redundant switch external to the system um, to, to meet your, you know, external disconnect requirements uh, that, that the most, uh, you know, I'd say rigid of jurisdictions are, are still going to look out for. You know, although sometimes with off-grid, you really don't even get too much of an inspection because they don't really know what to look for at this time. Um, and then I suppose one, one downside of an all-in-one unit is that if it fails, you know, the whole system goes offline, uh, at which point you need a, like a generator bypass. And so, you know, these, these units do have generator bypass switches built into them, uh, but that's assuming that you're not <laughs> needing to be working on and servicing it. Uh, whereas a, a stackable, you know, more expensive system, you know, one inverter can fail and the other one, you know, can be operating the system as you're servicing it. So there is some added cost to stackability, uh, but there's also, you know, so you, you know, you're buying more features. So let's let's look at some some other battery inverter features. Um, you know, you do have like in the Schneider system and the SMA system and these battery inverter systems, there is a mode that says, you know, we're going to interconnect to the grid, but we're going to disable back feeding the grid. So at that point, they're monitoring the current that comes in from the grid, much like your electric your meter on your side of your house monitors the current. And I did it a couple of different ways. Mainly, you know, you, you clamp current transducers around the main feed going into the house. And it monitors, much like an electrician's amp meter, the amount of current that flows through. And so on your, your high-end battery inverters, they have a mode to detect when the inverter is outflowing onto the grid and to uh, curtail the power from that. Uh, I don't like that methodology because even though you're using software to curtail the power, the utility will still consider it to be grid interconnected. And so if they have uh, additional fees put on to interconnecting solar to the grid, you know, this mode will not get you out of paying those fees. Whereas a, a kind of a one way inverter that is that is the grids on this side of it and the output is on this side of it and it's only a, a one-way street you know you can argue to the power company that that system is is not the output of the battery inverter is not interconnected to the grid it's all isolated from the grid it is physically impossible for a one-way battery inverter to backfeed onto the grid. Let's see, there are minimum uh, battery bank sizes for these charge controllers. So that, and that'll, that'll vary by the charge controller, but let's just say, you know, this is a uh, 440 amp hours and this particular inverter has the option between being a 24 volt inverter and a 48 volt inverter. And so if it's 440 amp hours times 24 volts, 
you know, that's going to be, um, I think it's about 10 kilowatts, uh, 10 kilowatt hours of battery capacity being the minimum amount. And so if you say, if you were doing a, a, a refurbished 24 volt, 10 kilowatt hour forklift battery, the kind of the low end of the price range is $90 a kilowatt hour. And so doing $10, uh, you know, 10 kilowatt hours, you're looking at, you know, you could put a thousand dollar forklift used forklift battery onto one of these battery inverters as a bare minimum budget expenditure. Uh, although 10 kilowatt hours is not very much, you know, most homes are using 30 kilowatt hours a day. And so 10 kilowatt hours really, you know, that, that might provide some emergency backup power, but not much else. Uh, another, another note, <laughs> You know, if you do a, a 24 volt or a 48 volt option on your battery inverter or charge controllers, it's going to be more cost effective to use the top end of the op of the inverter. You're effectively going to get twice as much output out of the inverter by using the the higher of the voltage ranges. You know, so if I'm trying to do really dirt cheap off grid for like a really small cabin and 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 I I'm because of budget limitations, I'm trying to do the smallest battery bank possible. I'm going to go look for an off grid inverter that is only up to 24 volts and not 48 volts because that, you know, the higher the voltage you go, the higher the cost. And of course, the, the downside of putting the smallest minimum required battery on the inverter is that you could blow through it. If you put 10 kilowatt hours of flooded lead acid on this 6.8 kilowatt inverter, you could fully discharge your lead acid in under two hours. And when you do that, uh, the efficiency is going to drop substantially. We may get to. When you talk about architecture of the systems, you got a couple, you got really two main options, and they're called DC coupling versus AC coupling. So to explain what this is, is you have to go from the solar modules, which are our variable voltage and more of a constant amperage, and then you have to get them into a battery bank, which is which is more of a constant voltage with a variable amperage. And so in order to do that, you have to somehow regulate the voltage coming out of the solar array. And so you can do that on the DC side or you can do that on the AC side. So on the, on the DC side, it's called a charge controller, but in National Electric Code, they refer to it as a voltage regulator. And so the, all that does is just the DC to DC uh, step down. You know, your solar array is generally operating at around 400 volts with a maximum range of 600 volts. And that'll step it down to your battery bank, which is nicknamed the nominal voltage of 48 volts. But it, on the high end, it'll actually go up to about 60 volts or just under. And so that'll take the variable voltage and relatively constant amperage coming out of a solar array and convert it into a relatively constant uh, voltage with a variable amperage coming out and into the battery bank. Um, AC coupling does the same thing, except it does it with an inverter first, you know, just like a, just like a batteryless solar array is plugged into an inverter, that batteryless solar array is still plugged into the inverter, and then you get a bi-directional battery inverter that can just both charge and discharge. And that will um, 
you know, that does the same thing. Now there's there's some technical discussion on which is better. Theoretically for off-grid, DC coupling is better. And, you know, AC coupling should be more expensive. It should be more expensive to go from DC to AC and then back from AC to DC. And then again, before you go into your load from DC to AC, Theoretically, that should be less efficient. Theoretically, that should be less costly. I mean, more costly. Where the theory, though, breaks down is there's a heck of a lot more batteryless solar inverters on the market today than there are large charge controllers. You know, most of the charge controllers on the market today are designed for like, you know, people living in RVs or, you know, uh, you know, tent camping in the woods or something like just just tiny, tiny 150 volt charge controllers. And most solar arrays are designed for 600 volts. There simply are not many. I, I only know of two residential class 600 volt charge controllers on the market and so even though theoretically inverters should cost more than charge controllers um, and also the efficiency loss should be greater when you're doing this three-step process rather than going through a one two-step process to get into your load um, just the where the market is at with manufacturing support AC coupling is about the same cost and efficiency as DC coupling. And so certainly there are there are times when AC coupling is where you want to go. For example, if you're retrofitting, if you already have a batteryless solar array on your on your home, you can just keep your existing inverter and then add a battery inverter in parallel to it. Now that would be a, a stackable inverter of sorts. So your battery inverter cost does go up a little bit, but that's a, a very common way to do it. And one advantage of doing that is during the day, you get the power output of both your solar inverter and your battery inverter going into the load. So, you know, it, you, you get what you pay for, a little bit more expensive system is gonna have a little bit more functionality. But there is one big technical advantage of DC coupling, which is that your batteryless inverters need to see a grid signal in order to turn on. And if they don't see the grid signal, they turn off. And they don't turn back on again until they see that grid signal. And so the problem is, if you run completely out of juice, then your battery inverter turns off. And then your solar inverter turns off and then the sun comes back on, but your system is still online because the power can't get into the batteries. Whereas the DC coupling has the ability to black start, which means if your batteries run out of juice and then the sun comes back up in the morning, then the charge controller kicks on and charges your batteries back up again, which you know, the, the concept of like running out of electricity in the middle of the night sounds kind of scary, but for the most part, you're asleep and you just, you know, you know, maybe you, your alarm clock doesn't work, but as soon as the sun comes back up, you're rocking and rolling again. Um, whereas, whereas that functionality is not inherent to AC coupling. And so I prefer DC coupling for that reason. You know, as an installer, you know, I don't want to have to worry about fixing my customer's system. If they run out of power, they don't know what to do. I'd much prefer a solution where it's like, well, just you know, wait for the sun to come back up and you'll be just fine. That's a little bit easier of a, of a system solution. Then again, you can you you still have options you know for one you can do both you can ac couple and then add a very small solar array maybe one or two panels with a cheap 150 volt charge controller and dc couple that to your battery bank and then face those eastward 
so that you can get, you know, some juice going into those batteries first thing in the morning. You know, maybe you put the battery bank on the east side of the house and faced your modules east and, and there you go. Um, you know, even more pragmatically, you, you'll have a generator there. And even if that generator is only used a couple of times a year, you know, if your client messes up and drains their batteries because they're using way more electricity than what the system's designed for, you know, the, the generator will make sure those batteries do not discharge and also serves as additional, you know, safety uh, and double redundancy features that you're most likely going to want to have anyway. And so the, the fact that you can combine a generator into the mix uh, really eliminates the, the discussion of like, well, DC coupling is better because you can black start, which you can't do with AC coupling. Uh, if you have a generator, it doesn't matter. And so, so technically for off grid, DC coupling should be better, but the, the cost between a large DC charge controller and a solar inverter are about the same cost. The efficiency of these solar inverters is a little bit better because they've had a lot more research and development put into them. And so I wouldn't sweat whether or not you do AC coupling or DC coupling for off grid. Now, if you're grid connected, it's the opposite. The, the AC coupling uh, has a little bit more of an edge because with a grid connected system, you you really want to sell back to the grid and not charge, you know, not really use the batteries, have the batteries just kind of hang out for backup purposes. So, you know, that's, the, so I would not spend too much more time discussing the nuances between AC coupling and DC coupling. You know, if you already have an existing solar array on site, AC coupling is how you want to go. If you're starting from scratch, I think DC coupling is a little bit more elegant uh, than AC coupling. And so there's, <laughs> there's a variety of charge controllers on the market. You can find these little $20 charge controllers on eBay that only do one or two solar panels and have a 12 volt output. Um, some very reputable charge controllers that solar installers love are Outback and Midnight. And, and actually, uh, um, let's see, I believe Midnight was a spinoff of Outback and you can kind of see the, uh, the, the, they they come from the same roots. They all actually Midnight Outback and Schneider all come from a parent company called Trace uh, and Magnum as well. So over the last you know couple of decades, we've had you know these four American charge controller companies all kind of split off from the same um, originating company. And then there's a, a Japanese charge controller called TriStar. And the, you know, what I would say is Schneider and TriStar are the only two 600 volt charge controllers on the market. And then um, Outback has a, has a 300 volt charge controller. And then the rest are generally 150 volt charge controllers. And they're just, you know, that, that means, you know, as a solar installer, I'm used to doing you know, nine, 10 module long circuits, and that's a 600 volt circuit, and that plugs into a 600 volt charge controller. If I use a 150 volt charge controller instead, I might only have two or three modules per circuit, and that's just a lot more wiring to do up on the rooftop. On the ground, all that extra wiring doesn't really matter, but on the roof, you want to have as few circuits as possible just to make the install go easier. Now, there's also a popular batteryless inverter system called Solar Edge, and Solar Edge is putting a voltage regulator up on the rooftop as well. And so, 
you know, technically Solar Edge has a system that has a charge controller built into every single panel up on the rooftop. They just use it to directly feed their inverter and, and only a limited number of their products have, uh, have the ability to be combined with a battery. Now here's where, where DC coupling and using you know, Schneider or Outback or, or Midnight gets a little costly, is in the balance of system material. And so I, I just wanted to put this out as an example. Schneider, each one of these charge controllers needs to land on a breaker. And really, each one of the charge controllers, you have a positive and a negative. And really, you're going to do a, a floating system where, where neither side is, is grounded. In, in the old school design, you would ground the negative except that creates a, a blind spot where current can be ground faulting to ground without triggering the ground fault detection. And um, you know, that's, that's not considered to be the best practice now. So you know, if you are following best practices and doing a floating system, you're gonna have a disconnect switch on both the positive and negative side and Schneider sells these breakers, these high amperage DC breakers that you just can't find at Home Depot for $100 a pop. And so that right alone adds, this is about a $1,000 uh, charge controller, you know, and that increases the price by about 20% to buy the breakers that come along with it. Well, <laughs> Now, I don't want to buy that. I don't want to pay for that. And so after my first project, I looked at these breakers and found that they were actually made by a different manufacturer. And I looked them up online and I could find three breakers for $50 total. And so you have to kind of beware of the balance of system material cost associated with um, these these smaller manufacturers in the in the charge controller space because you know they'll their their balance of system stuff usually they're not making it and that means they're going to be putting a, a pretty big markup onto it so the concept i want to introduce now is is the dc bus so your electric service panel has a bus bar down the middle. Actually, there's a leg one and a leg two bus bar. And this is an AC bus bar that all the circuits on your home are plugged into the AC bus bar and they're all sharing the same voltage. So the concept is, well, why don't we do that with DC? And actually you do, I mean, the, the charge controller feeds the battery bank and the battery bank goes to the inverter. And so the charge controller is outputting 48 volts nominal. That's the nickname for it. It's actually a little bit higher than that. And then the battery is outputting 48 volts. And if I have another charge controller here, <laughs> I'm tapping them together. If I have another charge controller here, I'm tapping them together. If I have another battery bank here, I'm tapping them together and then going into the inverter. And so you do kind of start assembling your own DC bus bar, whether it be provided to you through a manufacturer uh, third party service panel or you're buying an electrical box and buying bus bars and wiring them up inside the electrical box on your own. And so what, what some inverter manufacturers are doing, this one's a, a US startup called PICA. You know, what PICA says is, hey, we're putting a charge controller up on the rooftop you know, Solar Edge puts one behind every single panel. We're just going to put one behind a circuit, a single circuit. And then we're going to have a little 
battery management system where we can just plug the battery into the circuit and keep on going down to our inverter. So their bus bar system is, is a lot more plug and play, whereas when I'm doing my bus bar systems, I'm buying a box and I'm custom building it inside of that box. Bus bars are just metal bars. They're just pieces of metal that the current all, you know, rides through. You know, there's certain breakers and fuse protections that you have to do when you're landing on a bus bar so that it doesn't backfeed during a, a fault event. We're going to get to that towards the end of class. So what I find kind of challenging about off-grid design is the, the equipment room where everything's going to go into. Because in, in batteryless solar, you're just putting an inverter on the side of the wall. You know, it might go in the garage, might go on the north side of the house to avoid the sun, might go on the south side of the house and you build a little shade structure over it. But you know, typically I'm just on, on my designs. I'm, you know, my, my solar array is up on the rooftop. So here's my solar array. And then I go into the attic and run my cable through the attic and come down the soffit. I mount my inverter on the side of the house somewhere near the meter. And then I tap it in one way or another. Well, now you have additional batteries. <laughs> and then when I go with the, not the, the expensive battery inverters like Outback, but I go with the cheap battery inverters from China, you know, the, the Chinese battery inverters, I'm not trying to say they're bad, I'm trying to say they're cheap. And so what that means is the, the Chinese inverters are typically designed to go inside of a temperature regulated room that's not a dusty or wet environment. Whereas Outback has a more expensive inverter and it's rated for outdoors. Well, okay, but even so, elevated temperatures are going to reduce your inverter performance and they're also going to reduce your battery life. And so what I really like doing is putting all this stuff inside of a, a closet or a custom built box and it starts taking up a lot more space. So what you, we have to remember is that all the space around the, the service area of your electrical panel needs to be dedicated for electrical. So your, your gas pipes and your water pipes have to stay out of the immediate vicinity of your electrical working space. It's not that they can't be in the same room, but you have to have enough clearance per National Electric Code for all of your electrical stuff to be serviced and worked on without you getting into bumping up against the water line or gas line. And that's, that's vertical clearance. And that's also the, you know, the Y axis or whatever the Z axis, you know, for going, moving backwards. Unsealed batteries produce gas. And so your room needs to be vented. You know, it's very common to put a hood over the batteries and directly vent the gas to the outside. Now the gas is light, it's not heavy. And so you could just put a hood over it and kind of plumb it out the, the top of the room through the wall. Now, a lot of your, your inverters and charge controllers come with fans built into them that operate when the system is, is flowing current through to kind of help you induce airflow in the room while the gas is being emitted. There's actually a, a difference between uh, U.S. 
fire code and international fire code when it comes to room ventilation. Remember this room ventilation only applies to unsealed batteries of which there's lead acid. There's another kind called nickel cadmium, which you know some people like. I I just stick with lead acid if you're going with an unsealed battery and lithium ion if you're doing a sealed battery. Um And so the, the International Fire Code says uh, you have to have an airflow, a ventilation system that can move, you know, one, you know, basically one percent of that can move enough air to make sure that the hydrogen accumulation is no greater than one percent of your room volume. But that could be a fan that turns on and off. International Fire Code has an additional requirement that says you have to have continuous ventilation of one cubic meter or one, I guess, cubic foot per square foot of room area, floor area. And so there's, there's two requirements. One, that you have enough ventilation to uh, clear the hydrogen out of the room so that it doesn't concentrate. And then two, that you have continuous ventilation. And so on your high-end battery systems, they'll put a cabinet inside of the room and just plumb the cabinet directly to the outdoors so that it's easier to uh, meet the continuous ventilation requirement without having a, a big fan in the room that's always on drawing power off of your battery. And the, the difference is that the, the, the National Fire Code has the same requirements, but it's a either or requirement. It's one of the following, not both. In International Fire Code, it's both. So some additional considerations, you know, in this battery room, you want to prevent access to unauthorized personnel. So, you know, the battery room should be locked. Now, you definitely want that because, of, you know, the batteries are charged. I mean, we were uh, picking up hoisting one of these heavy batteries up with a chain using some lift equipment we had to wrap the chain in insulated tape because the chain kind of fed, fed through the case of the battery bank and we we're actually getting some arcing from the battery to the chain without that insulated tape so you know this is hot electrical stuff and even if it's protected Physically, you know, there's still an element of danger there where you don't want just, you know, the kids getting into the battery room and and playing around with it. You know, as an installer, you make enough mistakes. You know, to someone, you know, as an installer, you have to be very careful. You know, you don't want to drop a wrench into the battery and and you know cause that wrench to light up with flame. You know, you you uh you can get kind of lazy and start using the battery as a shelf and and get messy you know you don't want to do any of that you want to you know, hands off dust free you know protected locked um so ventilation is just one aspect of it sealed batteries don't require ventilation you know, an air-conditioned room is considered to be a ventilated room, but it's not always on. You know, spill control for the batteries with your electrolyte. You know, so there's, you, you want to put the batteries on an insulated pad and then uh, 
you know, really you would want to have a tray with a pad and then the batteries on top of that. So the electrolyte is contained if it ever were to spill out. And you think, well, how is a 3000 pound rectangle ever going to tip over and spill? You know, it's not that they tip over and spill. It's that you've put too much water into the battery. And then when it's under vigorous use, that electrolyte expands in volume and then comes out over the top of the battery. There's additional requirements for uh, public spaces, uh, especially those involved with children or healthcare. Um, you know, lead acid batteries are capable of accepting a high temperature range. They can go to, to you know, elevated temperatures better than lithium ion can. Now lithium ion, you really got to keep cool because when you use them at higher temperatures, they degrade a lot faster. Now, some people are concerned about what about freezing temperatures, but actually, you know, lead acid and lithium ion can get down to below freezing before they start to freeze. That electrolyte is like salt water. You know, it really gets down to about ne about 10 degrees Fahrenheit before the electrolyte starts to freeze. And so if you have an insulated box, you know, just the heat from the equipment itself in your insulated box is, is generally all you need to keep those batteries warm. But there's still an ideal operating temperature for these, these things, which is around 60 to 70 degrees. You know, often they're, as you can tell, they're rated for an ambient temperature of 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's not a bad idea to put temperature regulation in your room. And that's where I get more onto the, the Chinese bat battery inverters that are cheaper and designed to be in a protected environment because, hey, if, I'm, if I want to keep my stuff dust and dirt free and temperature regulated, you know, that means I'm putting them in a, a, a closet or a custom built box anyway and so i don't need the environmental protection of like a nema 3r battery inverter and so all we can see here is on on here's the schneider battery inverter and once you start getting to uh, above 77 degrees ambient once you start getting into 90 degrees ambient or even hotter, the performance of the inverter begins to decline. You start to get less output from it. Oh, so, so batteries actually store a little bit more power at higher temperatures. And, uh, you know, what we see here is, is they can actually even get below zero degrees without freezing, you know, 10 degrees Fahrenheit or so. The, the, what this is, is, is capacity versus temperature. Once you get down to about 10 degrees or less, you got to keep the batteries at least 50% charged to avoid them freezing. And that, that's where it gets a little tough because you know, in the winter time, that's when you wanna use the batteries. And so keeping them 50% charged in the winter time, if your batteries are in an outdoor box, yeah, the batteries won't freeze, but if you could do a little bit more temperature regulation, then you could get a little bit more useful range out of them. Now, all, all this graph is showing is that uh, 
you know, batteries are, are proven to have fewer cycles when they operate at higher temperatures. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is temperature controls are not required for lead acid. They're a very good idea for lithium ion and they're an okay idea for lead acid. You don't, abso you don't absolutely need temperature controls like you really should with lithium ion. Okay, so what that means is often your batteries are gonna be put in um, a basement, maybe lowered down a little chase area. You know, maybe you're building, a, have a built a room into your garage. It still becomes very difficult with these large battery banks to put them into a small space because of National Electric Code. You know, what National Electric Code says is, you know, your serviceable area has to be accessible. And so both of these two pictures taken off the nickel cadmium battery manufacturer's website, both of these two pictures have code violations. You know, the first one is this, where you're, if you have one piece of electrical equipment and it occupies the same plane as another piece of electrical equipment, you cannot have more than six inches of depth between them because to access this service panel, I have to reach over this battery bank. And so they say no more than six inches. So that's that's a code violation there. You know, the other code violation is that if you wanted to stick your hydrometer down the back of this battery, you know, there's no real good way to access that. Now we can see these terminals and stuff are kind of wedged back in there. You know, so they got their, their working space here, but they don't have their working space there. So this is kind of a, a, a tough problem. Um, you know, behind you, you need about three and a half feet. You know, it depends on if there's other electrical equipment behind you, if there's a wall behind you or empty space behind you, it ranges from three to four feet. The width of the working space is a little bit easier. It's just 30 inches or the width of the equipment. So you're generally gonna have a 30 inches wide of dedicated electrical space anyway. The height is six and a half feet of dedicated space. So it's this this depth is a little bit harder. And then there's that other depth dimension of six inches of not extending that we were talking about. And so here is our our kind of storage room. And we're kind of shoving the batteries, you know, this is not really intended as a full-time use room, but we're kind of shoving the batteries against the wall here and the charge controllers and inverter system and service panels here. You know, um, it's like, okay, well, you know, this is a large wall, but these multiple battery inverters and service panels and batteries really start to eat into that space. So we're not talking about like a water closet sized space here we're talking about a you know a legitimate uh room no, that's your... so here are our two six kilowatt inverters by themselves not large enough for uh a larger suburban home you know they're about 30 inches wide each and so now we got about five feet here, and then we got another about 30 inch wide service panel and about a 15 inch wide charge controller. So then we got another, you know, five feet. I guess they're a little bit skinnier than that because this this setup for for four charge controllers, Four charge controllers is probably overkill. These are 600 volt charge controllers. They're the largest charge controller on the market. They're about 4.8 kilowatts 
each and I'll often oversize them grossly. And in grid tied solar, you're trying to output every kilowatt hour onto the grid. So your, you know, your solar in and your output is about, you know, uh, a 20 percent upsize going from solar to the inverter output. In off grid, I'll often go for a, a 50 percent upsize. And that's because you know on a on a on a sunny day you're just gonna have stranded energy. It's on those partly cloudy days where you know that 50% upsize becomes <laughs> because all the panels are producing half of what they normally would, you know, becomes within the range of your output capacity. And so just looking at the inverters and the service panel and the charge controllers, you're looking at you know, around eight feet of dedicated space, and that's before you get to your battery. So we're looking at some battery dimensions. You know, this is the, the one from yesterday we kind of selected in a very brief design exercise. That gives us two battery banks of 122 kilowatt hours. Well, they're they're 38 inches long by 10 inches wide by 25 inches tall, and we had eight of them. And so, if we stack them right next to each other, you know, eight times 10 inches, that's 80 inches. So you're looking at you know about seven feet long for these batteries to go back to back to back for you know what I would say is a uh, um, typical size of a solar consumer with solar consumers tend to have slightly larger homes, slightly more affluent than your typical homeowner. And so going back to this battery room, we actually have a problem with both of these configurations You know, what we really should do to, to, and then the problem is you can't service these cells back here. And so there's a, there's a couple of ways you could do that. One, you could have an access door from the other side. Now, after thinking about this a little bit more, you know, what the conclusion is, is the most space efficient way to site a flooded lead acid battery bank is to take the short end like this and put it up against the wall. So your battery bank kind of sticks out from the wall so that you can access, you know, all sides of it without having to reach over the battery bank to do it. And so kind of the, the most cost effect, the most space efficient design, you know, if this is if this is eight feet here and this is, what do I have the dimensions on it here? This is, a, you know, that's about seven feet. So this is about a 16 foot long room. And you would think, oh man, a 16 foot long room, I should have plenty of space for my electrical equipment and my battery. But if you want to locate them all on the same wall, you know, what you'd have to do is something, you know, kind of like that with your battery so that you still could access it. And this would have to have, you know, about three and a half feet of space here. And this, because there's electrical equipment on both sides, would have to be about four feet of space. And, you know, this right here, the short end of it is, what was that? You know, 38 inches. So 38 inches, let's just call it three feet. And then this one is eight feet. And so you're already looking at, you know, a, a room that is 12, you know, plus seven, you know, uh, uh, if you want to put everything along one wall, you're looking at a, a 19 foot by, you know, seven feet plus three, you know, by 10 feet. You know about 190 square foot of space 
in order to cite the control room for a robust off-grid system that would power your typical suburbanite house about 190 square feet in a long rectangle by the way i have a youtube channel that i put all the recordings of these programs onto and so i'm going to type in my my email address and you can just send me an email after class if you want the recording. All right, let's talk about racking for a minute. We don't have a lot of time, so this is stuff we cover in other programs, but I think it's kind of important. Um, now, one thing is to reinforce the corners of the array with more attachments than typical. So typically you're putting your attachments that go into the roof four foot on center up to six to eight feet on center. And so I would say at the, at the corners of your roof, you might wanna go down to, to putting an additional attachment two foot off the edge if your normal spacing doesn't already have one there. In areas of heavy snow, you want to reinforce the bottom edge of the array because the weight of the snow on the array puts additional stress on those bottom attachments. And so if there if you if you don't have these additional attachments, you're doubling up the force on the attachments that are there. And so we're just talking about in areas where it's heavy snow. So if you have to ask if you're in an area where there's heavy snow, the answer is no. You know, this is areas where you get snow on your roof for, you know, two to three weeks a year. You want to reinforce that bottom row so that you don't crush through your roof decking. A one one aspect of solar design that um, hasn't really I haven't seen it in the market yet, but one thing that I I think of uh, this was this came to me from a designer and they I saw that they were calculating the worst uh, tributary area for rainwater runoff. And so rainwater runoff is real interesting. You don't want to put your solar array all the way down to the very edge of the rooftop because then the water will run off the roof and not hit the gutter. At the same time, I have to wonder when you get all this rainwater, you know, instead of hitting the roof evenly and then trickling down, you know, now it's hitting the panel and then all accumulating and then hitting underneath the panel all at once. And so what I try and do with, especially with shingle rooftops, is to kind of set my bottom row of panels, you know, just so, so that under torrential rain, the water will kind of just go off into the gutter or maybe hit the very bottom row of shingles that could be more easily replaced without replacing the whole roof. So yeah, I, I have yet to see what these legacy solar arrays, I've yet to see any reports of the underneath the array being eroded, eroding the shingles, but that it's something I'm looking out for. I predict we'll hear about that in the, next couple of years to come. Of course, some houses don't have gutters. Now, I think aesthetics are really important to me. I didn't like this design. It just looked very uh, asymmetrical. I wanted something a little bit more cheerful. 
you know, when I when I pick out my solar panels, I'll often opt for an all black solar panel. I don't really get too hung up on the wattage. You know, and in and, and higher valued markets where electricity price is higher, by all means go for the top shelf solar panel. Yeah, you know, I know a solar installer who does an all black panel and the panels that I use have little grid lines in them that you can see up close. His is like a sheet of black glass all the way through. Looks really cool. But he buys his solar panels for a dollar twenty-five a watt. And I buy my and and they're like 350 watt all black panels. You know, I'm buying 290 watt all black, but they have the grid lines panels. Except I'm buying mine for about 50 cents per watt. And so, you know, it's a trade-off, you know, in, in higher price electricity markets, you can go for a higher end, more space efficient, more energy dense solar panel. Uh, in, in Mississippi, where the rules are written against you and the price of electricity is already low, we have to go bargain bin hunting. But even so, even when I'm bargain bin shopping, I'll try and select an all black panel because I think it looks better. You know, as they say, black never goes out of style. And so even, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, if you have an all black solar panel, it won't appear dated. I'm very picky about my solar racking. Um, what I like in my solar rail is a big open U channel, kind of like what Unistrut has. So a lot of solar rails, they have this tiny little U channel that's about half the size. And then they have some, some support rail underneath just so a little tiny bolt can fit into there. I like a big open U because what I'll do is I'll take these cables that come off the DC optimizers or come off the back of the solar panel and I'll lay them into that channel. Now, so what I'll do is take my, my DC optimizers that are mounting underneath each solar panel and I'll use tie wraps to kind of press the cable into that U channel and secure it. And I'll do all of this stuff on the ground before getting up on the roof. And we lift it all up in one or two pieces and plug them into each other. So it's all pre-assembled. You know, anything you can do on the ground, not only will that improve your workmanship and, and increase the speed of the install, but it means there's less time you're spending walking around on the rooftop. You know, that roof is not intended to be a construction site. So you don't want to just tromp all over it if you can avoid it. You know, usually cables are managed on an array by zip ties or these little cable clips. Now, the problem with zip ties are twofold. One, they can break. Two, they don't give you a lot of flexibility. And that flexibility becomes a problem with the cable clip because you can kind of adjust the cable through the clip. These things clip to the underside of the solar panel. So the solar panel is, this is the, the module frame here. They kind of clip to the underside and then the solar cable comes through and kind of hugs the side. So you're getting all that slack managed so it doesn't hang down and drag underneath the array. Well, the problem with cable clips is that the cable can pull out of the cable. The problem with the zip tie <laughs> is that you might need a little bit more slack up on the rooftop and the zip tie, you know, if it's tight, it's not gonna give you it. 
So both of those can fail. And so what I'll do is I'll use zip ties to kind of pre-manage my cable into this rail. And But then when the, the solar module frame gets bolted to the rail, it, it effectively bridges that U. And so the, the, the solar module frame, you know, goes across like that. And so now it's the module frame itself secures the cable into that rail. And that means that cable's not going anywhere for the entire system life. And we're not relying on zip ties or cable clips. And then I'll do I'll do one kind of more step. You know, the problem with these these voltage regulators that go underneath the solar panel is that you got to kind of juggle the solar panel when you're mounting it down onto the rail because you got to plug in the solar panel into these boxes and then you get a bunch of loose cable that gets all messy that you have to manage but that loose cable is inherent to it because you got to kind of rotate the module into place and so you need that cable length there otherwise you can't plug it in before you mount it and so what i do instead and this is kind of a digression from the rest of class so i'm not going to spend too much more time on it but if I'm using the DC optimizer behind every solar panel uh, technique, what I do is I, I measure it very carefully and I put it underneath the next module over because what that lets me do is it lets me bolt the module to the racking system and then I can just reach underneath and pull these cables out and plug them in and I'll just wrap them together to tighten up the slack. And so between the, the optimizer to optimizer cables being vanished along this rail and then having a, a twist technique uh, to get all the slack out, and that's further assisted by the module already being secured on the rail so that you don't have to juggle the module while plugging in the optimizer and bolting down the module. No, you put the module on, square it up, bolt it down, and then get to your wiring. The, the end result, so this kind of goes through that, that technique a little bit better. And, and then the very last step is I'll put my transition box underneath the last module on the row and go into the attic so that all the so that you don't see any of the racking or the cabling outside of the array perimeter. And so the end result is that you have the undercarriage of your module is you can just look right under it and not see any wires at all. You know, there's actually the optimizers and the cable lips right there. Kind of, you can see them kind of going up and in, into this rail and then coming out the other side. We didn't do a, a internal transition for this particular group. This was a kind of a uh, this was a project I was doing for a client rather than one of my own for a developer. So they were kind of the design. Some installers will mount and landscape using a shared rail system. Um, I actually, I, I hadn't had an experience doing a shared rail system on a project recently. And what I discovered about the shared rail is that it, it bridges the gap between these modules. So sometimes shared rail works, but it depends. You know, it's sometimes it can be kind of hard to get your purlin spacing to line up with your module frame spacing. Now, so what, what other installers will do is they'll just run, you know, an additional rail if they're doing landscape.
uh, some installation technique. You know, you go and you you tap the roof with a hammer or a rubber mallet to figure out where the rafters are. It's really something that only comes with experience. You know, another common way to find where the rafter is is to get into the rooftop, get into the attic, and just measure off from the side wall. You know, again, that is something that it's not as easy as it sounds because you have to get good at figuring out how far the sidewall goes to the outside of the house and then how far the roof hangs over the side of the house. And so measuring out the attic or using a hammer to tap the roof is a good way to identify the rafters. And so what you'll do is you'll do this all the way across the top and then come down and do it all the way across the middle and then do it all the way across the bottom. And I'll do it independently so I don't get any confirmation bias. And with, you know, little wide out pen where I think there are rafters and then look how my map has gone from top to bottom to see if I'm on track or not. Combined with measuring inside the attic to see if the rafters are actually 16 inches on center or if they vary. You can use a stud finder to identify where the rafters are, but you cannot use just a $30 stud finder. The stud finders to identify rafters through rooftops are about $600 on up, and they're not perfect. You got to put down a sheet of flat cardboard because they don't work on this textured um, asphalt shingle. So there, you know, a lot, most solar installers will do a, a combination of tapping the roof, measuring the roof, and, you know, their, their accuracy improves with time. You know, otherwise you get little pilot holes that the flashing covers. So, you know, you drill a pilot hole, and if you miss, you know, you goop it up and then put your flashing over it. Now, I've become a big fan of metal roofs and not standing seam metal roofs. Um, you know, the, the problem with standing seam is, yeah, you're, you're clipping to the seam, but it becomes, well, how is this metal panel then attached to the rooftop? And so the, the problem is if, if you use rail to go across the rooftop, you know, just how the, the wind buffets the array around, you can get a lot more force into one attachment over here than your attachment over here. And that can override the capability of the seam. And so on a, on a standing seam roof, you generally, what I do is I go with a railless system where you're just mounting the panels kind of just right onto the seams themselves and clamping them down with clamps. And that also lowers them so they get less uplift force. Yeah, so kind of ironically, uh, the standing seam metal roof is like the weaker roof to attach solar to. The better way to do it is just to get a rolled metal rooftop, which is a little bit cheaper, and then use a metal roofing screw to just screw into uh, the rafter. And there are specialized attachments that come with butyl tape underneath them uh, to, to make sure that that roofing screw is, is watertight. I mean, heck, nowadays there's even, and that's really what we should have done on, on this project right here. You know, the only thing I don't like about it is this flex conduit kind of coming over the roof here. You know, what we should have done instead is now there's even, you know, little conduit supports for holding that conduit up off of the roof. You know, so transition boxes, 
you know, here's a very popular one called Sola Deck. And, uh, you know, what's, what's nice about the Sola Deck is that it's flashed. And so you can kind of, comes with that flashing. It's also metal and, and DC on the inside of the building has to be in metal. So it makes that transition up to the rooftop through metal uh, pretty nice. Now here on the right is another acceptable way to do it. You know, the problem I find with solutions on the right, which are like something you can piece together from off the shelf stuff at Home Depot, is that it, it becomes too tall. And so it will, uh, you know, it'll sit, you know, if it's, if it's greater than four inches up off of the roof deck, you're not going to be able to put a solar panel on top of it. And so it's going to, you're going to see it and it's going to be ugly. You know, the solar deck is kind of a custom box. That's nice because it's, it's shallow so that it can fit underneath a solar array quite nicely. DC inside of a building has to be in metal and it's not a DC thing that has to do with the quality of DC electricity as opposed to the quality of AC electricity. In a sense, it's like discrimination. <laughs> because AC doesn't have this requirement. You got AC Romex going through. So somehow in code, it got in that DC has to be in metal. That metal is for physical protection, not grounding, not system grounding. It doesn't have anything to do with that. It's for physical protection. And so when I look at the DC requirement in National Electric Code, I really think of it as being more like for for feeder conductors because these solar cables are not loads, they're power lines. And so you don't want to, you know, drive a nail or anything through that. And so they've added an additional protection requirement beyond what is afforded to AC. And so there is a metal cable and this is not to be confused with metal flexible conduit. So you get a, a metal flexible conduit, which is a bunch of rings of metal that's an empty tube that you then can put wires through. There's also a metal clad cable where the cable already comes pre-strung inside of the metal. And it's pricey, but it's useful. You know, I'll often buy um, a 6.4 plus ground, which will give me four number six conductors plus a number eight ground. And that's very intentional because the number eight ground is your minimum equipment ground conductor size. And so I'm using that number eight ground as my ground to go up to the rooftop and ground my solar array. That'll come out of the solar deck box. So there's a, a little ground bar, you know, there. And then I'll go out and I'll ground my solar rail. The modules are grounded to the solar rail. So, you know, I'll, I'll pick this number six size because the ground is undersized and the minimum size for your ground is number eight. And so I'll get, you know, I'll get a 6.2 plus ground if I'm just running one solar circuit up to the rooftop. If I have two solar circuits, I'll do a 6.4 plus ground. If I have three, I'll do one of each. And what that allows me to do is to mount the inverter. Now here's my side of the wall, and here's my inverter on the side of the wall. 
you know, what that allows me to do is, you know, here's my rooftop and here's my solar array on the roof. You know, what that allows me to do is mount my inverter on the wall, you know, and then I'll get into the rooftop and I'll make my transition box. And from that transition, I'll do MC cable through the attic and I'll come out the soffit. And at that point, I might strip away some of the MC cable run and transition into EMT and come down and land on the inverter. And that means I don't have to pull any wire through the rooftop. It's already done for me. Now, it's way more expensive to do it that way than to do EMT through the attic and pull cable through it, uh, but that takes a lot more time. And what I've found installers doing is, you know, if they have the solar array on this side, on the south side of the roof, and then they have their inverter on the north side of the roof, you know, they'll they'll snake their EMT down and kind of whip over the side and then go over here and then go over here and then come back and then go down onto their inverter. Whereas if you go into the attic, it's just a shorter run. So you can actually, you know, save some money by getting away with a shorter cable run by going inside the roof. And it makes it a lot easier to go inside the roof if you use MC cable. You know, the only the only thing I'd say with MC cable is it's rated for damp but not wet conditions. So if you use it outdoors, it needs to be sheltered. And so, you know, you can use it underneath a soffit, but if you extend it all the way down the wall, and you're not like in a covered garage parking or something like that, you send it all the way down an exterior wall, some electrical inspectors will say, well, you know, that's the, it might be a damp right underneath the soffit, but you need to transition into EMT conduit at that point because rain can splash up against the side of your house. You know, in, in my practice just recently, what I've done is I've done something very similar to this and transitioned into rigid into the rooftop. And then from rigid, I go into metal flex conduit and then I put a box in the attic. So I'll run my EMT up to that box. And as long as that box is somewhere accessible within six feet of where my transition goes, it's it's just real easy to do flex conduit in there and so i'll go and buy a specialized connector that's called like a, a nine hole or seven hole or three hole cord grip connector uh this one's made by a company called Heiko. and so i'll just plumb it up right here <laughs> shove my cords down to it and transition into MC into a metal box in the attic that's accessible. And at that point, I'll run EMT to the box and back down for cost cutting measures. And so there's there's a lot of just kind of things you can do for pre-assembly, whether the cable is already inside the conduit, whether you're building the racking down on the ground that you can do to kind of speed up your installation technique. We'll take a break in just a minute. I want to kind of finish out this section. So ground mounting, you know, kind of the, the problem I have with ground mounting and ground mounting is fine. You know, you want to do a ground mount instead of a roof mount. You just go and do what everybody else does, which is this scaffold style ground mount. It works very well. What I don't like about it is it's very hard to get underneath the solar array once it's built. And so for things like lawn maintenance, you know, weeds and grass growing up through, 
you know, it's not a fun process to weed whack underneath a high voltage solar array. And, and, you know, that's the, the downside of that kind of system. You know, typically you're drilling out concrete foundations for these things to go into. And, and sometimes these foundations can get, you know, seven feet deep. You know, that's, they, they get to about seven feet deep when you're just up on one post instead of two posts. And so the, the scaffold style has an advantage in that the foundations are a little bit more shallow, you know, something that you could dig out with a bobcat. Recently, I experimented with helical screws. You use the one on the right for kind of clay and sandy soils. You use one on the left for more rocky soils. And that was able to let me avoid concrete. Now, some sites, it might be a little hard to get a concrete truck out the site. Even if you're mixing your own concrete on site, you still have to transport the concrete material, which is quite heavy. And after you do it, you'll wish you had ordered the concrete truck with a long pump. And so the, the helical screws and helical piles uh, can eliminate the use of concrete on the project altogether, and they install with a bobcat. So that, that was kind of interesting. Uh, worked out pretty well. They were a little pricey, you know, about 85 bucks or 95 bucks each, and then you have to buy the pipe cap. No, but they, they go in pretty well. I don't know. If you can get concrete to site, it's probably going to be easier to drill out the foundations and do a concrete pour than to mess with the helical piles. But, yeah, I enjoyed, I enjoyed installing them. You got to use an upgraded bobcat with a vertical reach and upgraded hydraulics uh, to have enough power to twist the, the screws into place. Um, we use a laser level to keep our piles relatively level. You know, I guess you could cut them off, but that's a lot of cutting. You know, what utility projects do, instead of bleacher style, they'll do single posts. But even with single posts, A, the foundations are deeper. And then B, it's still kind of hard to get underneath here. It's easier, much easier than bleacher style, but it's still not, you know, easy. And so the, the utility scale, they don't really care about those deeper foundations because they're doing pile driving. Uh, if you're using a bobcat to auger out, you really could only get down about six and a half feet. And in my experience, the engineering drawings all want you to go down about seven feet. And you think, oh, well, that's no problem. I'll just dig out the rest with a shovel. It can't really do that with a 18 inch wide or two foot wide hole in the ground and a six foot shovel. You can't really extend yourself into the hole and dig up inch by inch. It doesn't work very well. No big deal. You put a sona tube down it and extend your concrete up out of the ground a little bit. So finally, we get to tracking. Tracking has taken over the utility scale market. You know, if you're doing a utility scale project, it's your your default is to do single axis tracking that does not do north-south tracking, it does east-west tracking and tracks the sun from the morning to the evening. Even up in the north part of the United States, they'll do east-west tracking with their utility scale. And the reason is it doesn't cost that much more than the previous style we were discussing. I mean, you're still buying 
the post, you're still buying the rail, you're still buying the clips. Really, the only two things you're not buying that are involved with the tracking system are the, the hinges that rotate and then the either slew drive that sits at the end or actuator that kind of goes in the middle, maybe with some additional stabilizer hydraulics. So it's not like you're reinventing the wheel here. Your, your hinges are pretty cheap. And so I thought, well, why aren't we doing on ground mounts, why aren't we doing east-west tracking for residential because that's what the big boys do for utility scale and they would not be doing it for fun utility scale they will only do east-west tracking if it's cost effective we're going to come back to that in a minute Another technique that East West that utility scales do is they use slightly taller solar panels that are about 20% taller than residential panels. The residential panels are easier to handle up on a rooftop, but if you make your panels 20% tall, you know, longer, well, you know, that just that becomes a little bit more cost effective. You're you're squeezing a few more watts onto the same structure. Now what's also interesting about that is that your cable widths get a little bit longer. So you know when you use 60 cell shorter panels, you get all this slack when you and you just plug into your next door neighbor and then you build a home run that goes all the way to the end here. What they do at the utility scale is they'll actually skip and go every other module and then they get to the end and then they come back. And that way, all this extra slack is being put to use instead of just being wasted voltage drop and you eliminate the need for this home run cable all the way down the end. So there's a little bit of cost savings there. It's a little bit more elegant. It's too complicated to do up on a rooftop. When you're looking at ground mounts, a common question is, well, where do you put the inverter? Do you put the inverter on the side of the wall over here, or do you put it out at the array? You could say the same thing with your charge controller. Do you put it out at the array or over here? If your ground mount is a very long distance away from your point of use, just like power plants are a very long distance away from the point of use, you want to use high voltage to transmit that electricity. And so what that means is you do not want to put an inverter that'll take 600 volts coming out of the array and step it down to 240 volts right at the array and then feed that back to the load. Instead, you want to keep the array up at its high voltage and invert at the side of the house and take advantage of, of high voltage, low amperage means you know less cross-sectional area on the cable. So you save a lot in your cabling costs if you stay with high voltage. And so that's why when I get into charge controller selection, I tend to choose high voltage charge controllers is because whether the array is up on the roof or you know down the road in a field, you know, I want to take advantage of that high voltage coming all the way home. You know, solar edge regulates the voltage coming out of the array and they don't quite get up to 600 volts it's more like a, a 400 volt fixed 
but you know still they're they're making sure that the voltage of the array is always high and that gets you a smaller home run cable it also gets you more panels on a given circuit because you have a, a if you don't use voltage regulators behind the panel there's less wiggle room you have to upsize your cables for voltage protection by an additional 25 percent and so you can get an additional 25 percent modules on the same circuit if you use solar edge but solar edge is not warranted for off grid but their inverter only costs a thousand dollars so you know you do get into this part in off grid design where you know maybe you have some pieces that are not designed for off grid but could be cost effective if you use them for off grid you just won't get support from the manufacturer but you know when you're building uh, a hundred thousand dollar off grid setup how important is the warranty on three thousand dollars worth of parts compared to the utility that you could get out of it so back to our tracking discussion, and then we'll take a break. Um, I don't really like double axis trackers. I don't like their aesthetic. I don't like how they look. The owners like how they look. So, you know, shame on me for saying that, but I kind of think they look like old school satellite dishes. They're just big and in your face. You know, I don't like the aesthetics of them. Whereas a, a utility scale single axis tracker, if you, if you built it like a residential and just did one long row, it could hug the edge of your property and kind of function as a fence instead of just doing big rectangles. The argument against tracking for off-grid is that you're already oversized you're already getting to this stranded energy in the middle of the day so you don't really need the extra power that your tracker provides you know it'll it'll give you a little bit more time on solar power instead of battery power in the evening and it'll give you a little bit more time on solar power instead of battery power in the morning. But, you know, it, it is often easier simply to add more solar panels. At the same time, you get more juice out of those solar panels when you track. So, you know, <laughs> ironically, maybe tracking is better for grid tied ground mounting than than off-grid ground mounting, because in grid tide, you're selling every single kilowatt hour, whereas with off-grid, you're already gonna have some surplus. And so with, with tracking, your battery is simply gonna get full earlier, and the, the impact of well, you're gonna take less load off of your battery bank because you're now tracking with it is generally overstated by the tracking providers. You know, at the same time, everyone thinks that tracking is grossly more expensive, but that's really not true. Uh, to kind of get us through these slides a little bit, you can come back and read these. These are more like notes, but you know, I, I built a tracker, you know, on the top of each pile, we put a $20 pillow block bearing. You're still buying the pipe cap. You're still buying the scaffold. You're still buying the modules and the same amount of rail and racking. And then, you know, buying, you know, at the end of the day, it was about a thousand dollars of the actuator and hydraulic supports to move the array. And so you're talking about, you know, in, in terms of parts, you know, on a, a $25,000 project, you spend about $1,000 more in parts to make it tracking. So on a $25,000 project, you're boosting the performance by another 
you know, 10 to 15 percent by only increasing the project cost by, you know, maybe two thousand dollars parts and labor. So you're spending another 10 percent to boost the production by another 10 to 15 percent. And that's just with one pallet. And so I wouldn't, you know, I don't know if I would do it again, to be perfectly honest. Um, I might. I might try and get good at it. You know, what? what's really happened is all the residential tracking companies from 10 years ago are now utility scale tracking companies. And so they've just abandoned the residential market. It's a lot smaller than utility scale. So there's no market force driving the need for single axis tracking in the residential market. But that does not mean that it is not cost effective, even just with off the shelf parts and a little bit of engineering know-how, you can make a single axis tracker and have it be cost effective in the sense that you will boost your production by more than the relative percentage cost increase in the the project but it is going to be a a piecemeal kind of jury rigged uh, uh solution not rather than something that is professionally supported and of course when a tracker breaks you know people talk well what about the increased maintenance of a tracker well even if that tracker is fixed in place it still produces electricity as mitch hedberg said i like escal i like escalators because when they break they become stairs you know, sorry for the convenience so anyway we're just going to kind of end that discussion and take a 10 minute break it's about 10 till and so we're going to start back up at the top of the hour um, and then we'll have about an hour left to discuss generators uh, we'll probably shortchange some one-line diagram discussion. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing with smart home stuff in terms of power management, and then talk about some real advanced concepts of tying together grid tied and batteries uh, in ways that are useful to the client, uh, but not necessarily ways that the solar manufacturers want you uh, to do in terms of, of taking the best of the grid tide and plugging it into the best of the off grid. So we'll take a 10 minute break, we'll pick back up at the top of the hour, uh, and then we'll uh, move towards the end of class.
we'll get started again in about a minute or so. All right. Uh, welcome back. Let's talk about uh, generators for a minute. And uh, let's see here. I think we got a Cummins expert, Timothy, in the uh, audience today. So, Tim, if you want to chime in uh, with any information that you care to share, feel free to. Um, when I started looking at generators for off-grid homes, I came across a, a product line that was being pitched as a renewable generator. That is a generator that was expressly designed to function with off-grid homes well that seems like a match made in heaven that seems exactly what you want a generator designed to work with renewable generation that's not the whole picture now for first you got to figure out well how am i going to start up the generator and that's really not something that the generator itself should be driving. That's something that the battery state of charge and the battery inverter should be driving. And so if a generator already comes with an auto start feature, it may be redundant. It might even conflict with the auto start feature of the battery inverter and some battery inverters will sell you an additional module for auto starting the generator and you're like well why isn't it built in well it's because these are usually stackable inverters and they only want to sell you one of them whereas an all-in-one you're only going to buy one and it's usually built into it and so here's a little auto start generator module, which can get wired up to the generator. You know what I was kind of noodling around with right before the end of the break. You know, here's a another auto start kind of module built into this all in one. And that's a one two wire generator auto start. And so that becomes kind of the, the interesting thing about the uh, generator auto starts is that they're, they're designed to accommodate a wide variety of generator auto starts. So, you know, there's some generators may have a different startup process than others. It may not be as easy as just clicking a button. And so a lot of these, these wires on this terminal, you may not even end up using. On a two-wire auto start, you may simply end up using two wires of this terminal block 
that get wired up to your inverter. Now, here's the thing. Generally speaking, it's only these stationary generators that have hardwired auto starts. Because when you think about it, code doesn't really want you to have a temporary plug that's plugged in full time to your off grid house to start and stop a generator. And so when you when you go and you look at portable generators, you know, let's just do a very popular uh, You know, the Honda, they actually had a recall recently for their current design of their generators. They have a fuel tank issue. I think they tried to make it a little too small and they were getting uh, fuel spilling out or something or other. I guess they didn't like me saying that. I'm trying to pull up. A picture. Let me let me start with this is made by the what a battery inverter manufacturer. And what you can see here is a little two wire auto start feature built into the portable generator that matches up with the two wire auto start feature. And I, I was looking for portable generators to have this feature. I was looking high and low for it. You know, generally, when you look at the, the face of these portable generators, you don't have a plug that'll give you an electric start. You may have an electric start. You know, this one is a, a crank start. You may have a button that gives you an electric start, but to take a portable generator, even if it has a remote control with an electric start, to actually wire it up to one of these, um, <laughs> you know, auto start modules, whether it's a two wire or what we were talking about with our, you know, a little bit more robust auto start module, you would have to kind of disassemble the electric start trigger and solder some wires up appropriately. And that's because portable generators are not designed are not supposed to be stationary generators. And so they will will often lack the ability to just hardwire out of the box a generator auto start feature onto them because they're not intended to be auto started. Whereas a stationary generator is. Well, the problem with, with that is uh, I don't have it well illustrated here. I'm going to have to go diving for the, the manual. Um, But this is only something that I'm I'm just now starting to to understand. But that that bypass switch inside the inverter that will allow you to fire up a generator and feed the same load that the inverter is connected to, if it's not an external bypass switch, it's an internal bypass switch.
So here's a, a reference to a 60 amp automatic transfer switch to integrate both the grid and the generator. Well, what happens if your generator can output more than 60 amps and it's wired up to a 60 amp bypass switch? It's going to burn up the terminal block. It's going to feed too much power through that internal bypass switch. So it's not so much an issue of the generator backfeeding the inverter or the inverter backfeeding the generator. It's more that the, the current from the generator, if it's substantially larger than the inverter output capability and they're wired together and it's flowing through an internal bypass switch of the inverter, it can burn up that terminal block. And so you really want your, your generator and your inverter capability to be relatively even. Let me try and pull up the, the wiring diagram here. You might not have it in the owner's manual. It may only be in the install manual. So let me scroll through this real quick. No, they're not. Unless it's at the end of this. No, that's, that's the wrong manual. But anyway... So if you're trying to wire a generator directly up to the inverter and have the inverter automatically switch on the generator when the batteries get low and feed the same load all in one, and this is why some battery inverters instead will have you use an external transfer switch and simply have the generator run the house until the sun comes back up and charge the batteries and keep the 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 inverter and charge controller and batteries isolated so that the generator does not charge the batteries it just powers the home and that's not the only way you can wire these things you can you can actually wire these battery inverters to support the generator such that the generator provides the base load and the solar battery provides power surges, which are hard on generators. So you can kind of improve the fuel efficiency of the generator using the battery inverter in what's called a generator assist mode. So there's a, a number of different ways you can wire a battery inverter to a generator. And depending on if you're trying to complement the power together or use it as a, a charger for the battery bank or use an internal bypass switch inside the battery bank or keep it completely isolated with an external transfer switch. There's different design considerations related to sizing. And that's a problem when it comes to stationary generators because stationary generators have become so large now that, that they're really better used to bypass the solar array entirely and then you just wait for the sun to come back up to recharge your batteries rather than using the generator power for that. Or you take the opposite approach and you go and you get a small generator and you just run it longer and you use it perhaps only to charge the batteries because a small, you know, three kilowatt portable generator on a 12 kilowatt inverter is is a, that three kilowatt generator is not going to be enough to run your whole house and so you might have a small portable generator just to charge the batteries up when the voltage gets low 
and that's not going to burn up any of the terminal blocks on your battery inverter. And so there's kind of a fundamental question. Do you want to go with a small portable generator to charge your batteries up when they get low, or do you want to go with a large whole house generator that you might bypass your existing system with and then, um, you know, then, and then maybe off of that, you have a separate AC charger circuit charging your batteries, but it's not, the, the generator output is not directly connected to, nor is it complementing the output capacity of the system. Or separately, do you want a complementary system where the generator and the solar array are working in parallel to boost the total power to the system? And then only in that case does the one system backfeeding the other come into play. But in the other cases, you have to think, okay, well, how is my generator power circulating through the system? And if it's actually circulating through the inside of the inverter and back out again, because there's a transfer switch built into the inside of the inverter, you have to think, well, you know, is my generator sufficiently larger than my inverter? Because it's not just an issue of backfeeding the inverter. It's also an issue of pushing too much power out of that transfer switch. A lot of people burn up their Ames inverters with generators, and I imagine that's why. So what's going on with this renewable generator? Well, for one, it has a generator auto start feature. And wire up your generator auto start module to it. But really, <laughs> There's, there's some bells and whistles on this renewable generator like a, a extended oil reservoir so that you don't have to maintain your generator so much. You don't have to change the oil as much. And I guess what that's assuming is that you're going to be running the generator a lot and so you don't want to change the oil all the time. But an off-grid system that's using the generator solely for backup a few times a year is not going to be running all the time. You don't need that extended oil pan. Well, then here's a, a resonator to quiet down the generator. And sure, a resonator is nice, make the generator not so loud, but then again, that's really a generator that's more for full-time or regular usage, and we're not trying to use our generator regularly. So these renewable off-grid features are not necessarily something that you have to have. And so here's, here's one. It's a specialized alternator with skewed Stator. And essentially what this means is that it, it improves the power quality coming out of the generator. So, aha, that's, that's the big difference between a renewable generator and a non-renewable generator is that the, the power quality coming out of the renewable generator is better than that of a standard stationary generator. You have to remember a standard stationary generator is not designed to run your house 24-7, 365 days a year. You know, it's only there to provide power to your house during outages. Whereas what this manufacturer is going for with their off-grid renewable generator is saying, hey, you're gonna be running that generator a lot, so why not spend a little bit more money and get a little bit better output signal from the generator? Well, you don't really need that if you're not designing your system to use the generator, you know, more than a couple of times a year. 
So you don't you don't necessarily need a a renewable off grid generator. You know any stationary generator works. And in fact, the uh, you know you're buying some features that are redundant, like the generator auto start feature. And in fact, sometimes it's better to have a dumb generator than a smart generator because you don't want the intelligence from your renewable generator to interfere with the intelligence of your uh, battery system. For instance, your house may not have any load, but you want to run the generator to charge up the batteries. Well, the generator turns on, and a renewable generator that has more variable speed output may throttle down and not do very much because if the house doesn't have a load on it and you're just trying to charge your batteries up, you know, it, it might not see the, the need to charge the batteries. There might not be a, a load there that's really drawing current, like a motor load or something like that. So quieter, larger oil pans, better quality output. You know, that is stuff you want if you're running the generator frequently and we're trying to design our systems to, to only run the generator a few days a year. Yeah, you know, and furthermore, the uh, you know it's it's not that even though maybe renewable generators are better at uh, throttling and being energy efficient when not using their full rated capacity. It's not like your whole house generator only has one output setting. You know, they they operate at 25%, 50%, 75% of the load as well. And so the short of it is, if you're just using the generator to charge the batteries and you're only planning on using the generator to charge the batteries a few times a year, you do not need a large whole house generator, nor do you need a, a premium renewable generator. You just need a generator. And at that point, you know, maybe the you want to balance the size of the generator. Now, I've heard of installers in off-grid rigs, and I, I'm not a big fan of this, but having two, you know, a large generator for bypassing the full house and running the whole house off of it, and then a small generator for just providing some additional complementary power, taking advantage of the bypass switch inside the inverter for when you only need 40 amps or 50 amps of power, um, and also being used to charge up the batteries when needed. Now you can you can find natural gas and propane charts to tell you how much gas the generators will use uh, depending on how much uh, you use them at. And so remember from yesterday, I was showing you the Excel sheets where we're plotting our generator runtime, and we were showing a 15 kilowatt generator running at full load for three hours, well, we can use that to say, okay, well, if it's a natural gas generator, if it's a propane generator and I'm running at full load, how much gas will it use? And take that off of the, the spec sheets. So let's just take a look at this. You know, if we have a, a 25 kilowatt generator running at 25% of the load for 24 hours, you know, if it's natural gas, that's at 45 cents a kilowatt hour. If it's at propane, it's about 21 cents a kilowatt hour. And that's precisely why I say you don't really want a generator for those cloudy days. What you want is a large battery bank because generators are a very expensive way to produce electricity. You know, you what you want is that generator there just a couple of days a year for when you really need it, not something like, oh, I'm going to save $5,000 and go with a 90 kilowatt hour battery bank instead of a, a, you know, a 100 kilowatt hour battery bank 
and that means I'm going to run my generator every other day in December. Now, no, you want even in December, you only want to run your generator, you know, maybe uh, you know once or twice a week at most, not every other day. So I'll actually set that when I'm doing my modeling as a parameter. I'll look at my generator runtime and how much money I'm going to spend in gas versus my battery bank size and how much money I'm going to spend on the batteries and use that as kind of the, the final variable to lock in my appropriate battery bank size. And so back to this graph that we were kind of looking at yesterday, you know, you can you can determine your generator run time and say, okay, I have to run my generator once during this period, and then maybe, you know, maybe even twice during this period, and how long am I running my generator for, and what's that going to cost me versus increasing the battery bank size, you know, maybe increasing the battery bank size by 100 kilowatt hours to overcome that deficit, and you know, I started with 90. So you know, over doubling the size of my battery bank uh, will not be cost effective. But instead of going with 90 kilowatt hours and having to run the generator there, you know, going with 120 kilowatt hours and not needing to run the generator during these times will save me enough in gas during those times to not have to. Um, you know, to justify the cost of the larger battery bank. Yeah, so Phil is Phil is saying, I, I think your numbers regarding the natural gas and LP gas costs are incorrect. And, you know, they, they may well be, um, you know, I'm just basing it off of this one chart that I got for uh, um, how many cubic feet per hour at a rated load uh, for the for the 25 kilowatt generator. So, you know, if if people have other opinions on on the price of electricity for a generator, you know, feel free to share them. So I put them there in case you want to pick through them. But in the interest of time, we're going to keep moving on. And so this is kind of fine tuning it to say, okay, well, um, you know, if my battery bank is so big and every time it hits an 80% depth of discharge, I'm going to turn my generator on, you know, how many times a year am I going to be running my generator to get it all the way back up to the top? Or if I go with a larger battery bank, and so you can see the you know, this is with a, a smaller battery bank <laughs> versus a larger battery bank that can allow for, you know, a longer period of time without charging the generator. You know, how many times here I'm, I'm based on my, my deficit, I'm running a, this generator four times with a larger battery bank versus, you know, 10 times with a smaller battery bank. And so that's kind of the, the final equation that I do when, when looking at my Excel sheet of energy usage is saying, well, you know, if, I, if I go with a 90 kilowatt hour battery bank, I run the generator 10 times between November and December. If I go with a 120 kilowatt hour battery bank, I run the generator four times between November and December. And I look at how much money I save on gas versus the cost of uh, of buying more batteries to optimize that. So James is saying, you know, what about the, the generator maintenance cost in your calculation? You know, no, I'm not. I'm not including. You know, in these costs, I'm not including the cost of watering the batteries, nor am I including the cost of oiling your generator uh, into these calculations.
Now, another thing to consider is assuming that it's well sized, a larger generator will take less time to charge the batteries than a smaller generator. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really on the fence on whether it's better to have a large generator or a small generator. I mean, a large generator has its uses in that you might only have a six kilowatt battery set up or a 12 kilowatt battery set up. And if there might be times when you want 20 kilowatts of power, such as having the whole family over, um, you might want a switch so that you can run off the generator and have all the power you need and not let your family members who don't understand your off-grid desires to be able to have all the electricity they want. Yeah, you know, at the same time, if your goal is just to um, keep your batteries topped off, you know, uh, a portable, a small portable generator with an electric start uh, is really all you need. And as of this month, <laughs> There's at least one company selling them, although I, I caution that I'm, I'm not sure if it's actually code compliant because I don't know if, if a plug and play auto start on a portable generator is actually something that uh, meets code or not. The, the lack of that feature on most generators today could be because people aren't used to doing solar off grid rigs with generators and this one company is providing a need for a market, or it could be that this one company uh, is skirting the lines of what is safe. You know, generally what I would do is keep all this stuff in a, in a box outside the house. And, you know, that safety issue is a little bit mitigated. Uh, you know, most off grid setups I've done so far have been on, areas where there's enough land available to do that on site. All right, well, what about one line diagrams? Let's take a, a little bit of look at one line diagrams. Now in, in other design classes, I talk about the use of computer software, solar design software and automation to develop the one line diagrams needed for permitting. Of course, battery systems are a lot more complicated, but you can find wiring diagrams like this inside the, the installation manuals of your battery inverter system. So let's just read through this real quick. You know, here we have a generator and our generator is feeding this switch right here. And the bottom side of this switch is coming down and going over and landing on our inverter. And so this is a case where we wire it like that. We wanna make sure that the output of this generator is the same as the maximum output of the inverter, I suppose doubled up, so that you know if if this generator output is is greatly larger than the what the terminal block of this inverter is rated for then potentially the generator could burn up that terminal block on the inverter and schneider has terrible customer service so if you burn up the terminal block on your inverter they're going to tell you to buy a new inverter they're not going to send you whatever you need to swap it out. I'll tell you that from personal experience. Yeah, here is our grid tied service panel. And it's feeding the top of these breakers. What we have coming down on A and B, I should probably use my spotlight for this. Coming down on the top of A and B, is the 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 output of our inverter so these are actually grid tied inverters that could feed out to the grid 
And they're also feeding, you know, coming out the top and then feeding down into here and coming out the bottom of this is a critical load panel. So what that is interesting about that is here in our design, you know, we have a grid type panel and when the grid goes down, this panel goes away and our critical load panel remains online. And so what's popular in this kind of setup is to put like unnecessary circuits. And some of those unnecessary circuits may be, may be heavy loads. And then just put what you need to survive on the critical load panel and that will will handicap you know that could prevent your kid from playing xbox off of your batteries when you're in off-grid mode now i don't think that's very much fun i like doing the hundred percent off-grid at which point you might just have some extemporaneous exterior lighting you know here and then your critical load panel becomes your main panel You know, here coming off the top, feeding this, let's trace this down. And we're coming down and down and down and over and over and over and over. And we're back to our inverter. And so our, our inverter can feed back to the grid. It can also feed our critical load panel. And so that tells me there's a, a transfer switch in here that when the grid goes out, it transfers over such that it only feeds the critical load. Let's take a look at our battery bank. Here's our battery bank cables, and they're coming and they're landing on this bus bar. And here's our charge controllers coming from the solar array, and they're coming down and they're landing on some fuses. And so here's our negative bus bar. And here's our positive bus bar. The negative bus bar is not fused. The positive bus bar is fused. And so this is a negatively grounded solar array. I prefer floating solar arrays where you would fuse both the positive and the negative. And then here are large breakers that are coming off of our battery and going into our inverter. And so these are disconnects for the battery, and these are disconnects for the charge controllers. And so there's disconnects for each charge controller, there's disconnects for the each battery, there's a DC bus bar for positive, a DC bus bar for negative. And this is why like Schneider sells this thing uh, as a specialty device, because they actually have an AC side to this panel and a DC side to this panel. A cheaper way to do it is just to buy an AC panel and then get a metal box and build your own internals. But of course, that is, it's not, it's cheaper, but it's not easier. And so we can kind of use that to develop our, our one line diagram. Now for things like wire sizing, conduit sizing, you know, I'll still rely upon the inverter sizing software. So often you can get this from the inverter manufacturer. That will tell you how many modules per string can go on the inverter. You know, this is a, a software called Solar Design Tool. And I think it's particularly good for residential and it's not very good for batteries. I mean, a lot of this stuff does not have um, batteries built into it because it's the merging market, but you can still get the one line diagram from the solar array down to your inverter and export this stuff into AutoCAD and then go back and, and combine your, your wiring diagrams that are a little bit more complicated than your one line diagram and uh you know nothing beats understanding how wire sizing and fuse sizing and conduit sizing is actually done but like what solar design tool does is you you know based off the equipment you're selecting 
and the links and your target voltage drop, it'll go in and, and do national electric code checks for you. Uh, this is just a slide that shows you cost of various balance of system material inverters, wiring, cable clips, cable connectors. In the interest of time, we should just move on. Let me check your handout. So I may have removed the smart home stuff from the presentation in the interest of time, but I feel like I've been moving along pretty well. So might as well mention what we're doing. Just give me a I'll comment on a few slides that I've I've cut in the interest of time, but um, you know I've put them into a class more focused on batteries. But here's a Here's a chart where you get the five hour, 10 hour and 20 hour rates of the batteries. And you can see like, if I take a, a lead acid battery over 20 hours, I can get, it'll discharge at a rate of uh, 1270 amp hours. If instead I'm discharging it over five hours, for each hour, it'll it'll only discharge at a capability of of a thousand amp hours total, and so I'll lose about eighty percent by discharging it over five hours versus twenty hours. And lithium ion does not have that same loss when you discharge it over twenty hours versus five hours. And so what I've done here is kind of graphed the, the discharge rate. And what you can see is that it's logarithmic. And the, the you know, once you get to a two hour discharge rate, you're really just losing all the capability of the battery due to heat. And so, you know, lead acid batteries are not good for fully discharging over a period of two hours. Um, lead acid, you know, the way you calculate the life of the battery and how many cycles it has is, um, you know, once you, once you know the size of your battery bank based on your generator run times and stuff like that, you can go back over your annual chart and see on av on the average cycle, how deep are you discharging it? You know, on some days we're discharging it 20%, and on other days we're discharging it, you know, 50%. So what's your average discharge per cycle? And so here it's saying, okay, well, at 50% discharge, we get 3,000, 2,900 cycles. At 80% discharge, we get 1,500 cycles. And what really strikes me about lead acid is that depending on your category of lead acid, see like here's one lead acid technology that at at 30 at 30 percent you get a little over 4,000 cycles, and here's a different one that at 30 percent you're only getting 2,700 cycles. Now this lead acid battery is going to be cheaper than that lead acid battery. You know, that might be a, a renewable or marina lead acid versus a forklift battery. And um, so in these charts, you can start to get an idea of uh, battery quality. Okay, so here we're talking about the the minimum feet. So it's a little bit more of an updated slide than what I presented. All 
All right. So when it comes to home automation, one of the things that's really lacking from Nest and you know Alexa and all that is energy usage. You know, it's like, oh, turn on the lights or turn on the TV or tune me to that channel, but it's not really thinking about integrating energy usage with smart home. But you can. I mean, these are our, our settings within the battery inverter itself will have some auxiliary outputs that say, you know, trigger this relay based on low battery voltage, high battery voltage. Hey, turn on that water fountain when the battery bank is full. Turn off the electric heat when the battery bank is halfway empty turn on the electric heat when the battery bank is full so that you can use electric heat instead of gas heat or wood chip heat you know there's there's some manual relays and triggers built into battery inverters that are often ignored but you can take advantage of thermostats have similar relays built into them In the interest of time, we're not going to spend too much time talking about these, these thermostats, but um, what I think is kind of interesting is there are thermostats that are battery only and then thermostats that are powered by the wall and have battery backup. And um, so I've, I've seen people take a battery only thermostat and then replace it with like a Nest and then all of a sudden their batteries are running out every two weeks, you know, because the nest is supposed to be powered by the wall, not running off batteries only. The batteries in the nest are there for battery backup. You know, so the settings don't lose when you run out of power. And so here's like a, a thermostat system that is set up for both a heat pump and auxiliary heat so that you're running off the heat pump until the heat pump can't heat the house anymore because of how cold it is. And uh, then that's when they turn on the auxiliary heat. So how this ties into home automation is that now your thermostats can be plugged into home automation. So we see that with Nest. There are little computers you can buy. This is called a Raspberry Pi. It costs 35 bucks and it can run home automation software. It's called a headless server because it doesn't have a screen. It just runs the software and communicates with all your smart devices. So there's a few things you need to add to a Raspberry Pi to do that. One is software, which is now open source. Google makes one called Home Assistant that's quite popular. Well, then you need your computer to communicate with your thermostat. So you have a couple of different options, Wi-Fi, is a popular option, but Wi-Fi has some downsides. It takes up a lot of energy, and it also doesn't get very good signal as far as going through walls. So the higher energy the signal, the less it's good at going through walls. There's a different protocol called Z-Wave. That's a Z-Wave. And so this is a, a Z-Wave antenna that just plugs into a Raspberry Pi, which already has Wi-Fi built into it. And so now your Raspberry Pi with your home automation software can communicate with your Z-Wave devices as well as your Wi-Fi devices. 
Here's some example of some Z-Wave devices. This is a 40 amp switch that can turn on and off based on Z-Wave controls. So we're putting our water heaters and hot tub on these Z-Wave switches so that we can turn them on and off based off software commands. This is a Z-Wave energy monitor. It goes inside your electric service panel and it monitors just like your electrician current transducer, it monitors the electricity that flows through your service panel. And you can buy these things as kind of rebranded software packages. So like, you know, there's, there's a device called Sense, there's a device called Snappy, uh, there's a device called the Energy Detective that are all these current transducer things you know, Samsung smart things as their own platform. But really what you need with home automation is the ability to program a custom solution. Almost like a, a website for a business is your home automation software for your house. And so I prefer just to get the generic stuff at a lower price point and then program it together. Now these devices here cost about 90 bucks each, but then when you buy them through the rebranded like Samsung or whatever, they end up being like 300 bucks each. You know, the Nest thermostat is expensive. I prefer to get uh, what's called, a, it's a brand called Radio Thermostat, which makes a Z-Wave radio, uh, a Z-Wave thermostat, and it's like 40 bucks instead of 300. You know, the fire alarms that we're putting inside this house are Z-Wave fire alarms that are also carbon monoxide detectors. And often you'll get, you know, a lot of Z-Wave devices will also relay temperature information to the point where you don't really need a thermostat anymore except a right next to your air handler unit to trigger that. Uh, even cheaper still is remote control. You know, Z-Wave, what it is, is you've actually had Z-Wave devices in your home before. Z-Wave operates at the same frequency as I would, 1990s cordless home telephones. So remember how you had a home telephone that, that, uh, that was wireless and you could only get about you know, 25 feet away from the receiver before it bugged out. And then all of a sudden there was a second generation where you could get, you know, 100 feet away without it bugging out on you. You know, that's the same frequency that Z-Wave uses. So it's not very good for video chat or audio, but it has enough transmission data for all these devices to relay their turn on and off triggers without using Wi-Fi, without using the energy of Wi-Fi and uh, you know, running it on a headless server with Raspberry Pi, it's encrypted and less hackable than Wi-Fi. Now these are little $5 remote control plugs that turn on and off with a switch, with the press of a button. Now the signal quality is not as good as a Wi-Fi switch or a Z-Wave switch, but Wi-Fi switches, at least up until recently, have been running 30 or 40 bucks an outlet, and Z-Wave outlets are, are you know, 10 to $20 an outlet, Whereas these remote control switches are easily found for less than $5 each. The question is, well, how do you hook that up to a computer so you can control it? Well, there, you know, a benefit of Raspberry Pi is that they have a lot of development chips. So here are uh, RF antennas that you can plug into your Raspberry Pi that are cheap, that'll allow your Raspberry Pi to send RF signals. 
And so the combination of controlling your outlets and controlling your thermostat and controlling some heavy duty amp devices and, and, and integrating that into service panel monitoring so that when you have a spike in your load, you can adjust your thermostat settings and water heater settings can get you to stay within the parameters of your system. So, you know, what's, what's kind of interesting about this next upcoming project is we have a large house and a 12 kilowatt inverter and the home based on historic energy usage of their old house should not exceed 12 kilowatts, but there's so many breakers in this house that the concern is, yeah, but what if they're using their hot tub and the electric sauna, you know, and everybody's home watching television in different rooms? Yeah, you know, we got two plans for that. You know, plan A is to use intelligent load controls so that when the hot tub really cranks up, the thermostats in the house, you know, cr you know, stop the air conditioning from cranking for a little bit. Now, not forever, just until the hot tub stops cooling down. And then plan B is the old school manual transfer switch that can switch them over to grid power and back onto their full 48 kilowatt, 200 amp service. So now let's talk about this concept that I call Franken Solar, which is combining a lot of what we've talked about for retrofitting batteryless solar arrays to be off grid, or for establishing a game plan where you can build out your solar array in stages and yet have a game plan for going off grid. So if you have good grid policy now, you can take advantage of it. And if you have bad grid policy later, you're prepared and you know what to do to go off grid. And it, it may also be, hey, you have good grid policy, so you want to sell back to the grid, but you also want to have whole house backup power with batteries, but lithium ion's too expensive or your battery, your solar inverter manufacturer does not allow you to operate in an off-grid setting. Well, what do you do then? Well, you got to start hacking a system together. And then there's this other problem of double redundancy where it's good to have, but then again, you're just buying two of everything. Is there a smarter way to, you know, buy a lithium ion battery bank and a lead acid battery bank instead of two lead acid battery banks or two lithium ion battery banks. So can we achieve double redundancy without repeating parts? So we're gonna start with a very popular, if not the most popular American solar system. They're actually made in Israel, but popular in America, Solar Edge which is very interesting because they have a um, they have a batteryless option and they have a lithium ion option. And so right here they're saying you can't install solar edge with a generator unless it's on a manual interlock switch. Now this is this is from Schneider's battery inverter. It says, hey, you know, you can AC couple a solar array with our battery inverter, but you can't backfeed the battery inverter with more power than it can take. You know, when, when that solar array is on, you need to make sure that all the power from the array is being consumed 
or that you know you're you're using power to charge the batteries but not more than what the inverter is rated for and that when the batteries are full we have to turn off the solar array somehow well there's there's a trick that high end battery inverters use which is to change the line frequency slightly when the batteries get full. And that triggers the AC coupled batteryless solar inverter to turn off because it thinks the grid has failed because the frequency has shifted from 60 hertz to 57 hertz or 63 hertz. And so that turns off the solar array for five minutes and presumably the batteries then drain and then the solar array turns back on and the batteries fill back up and then it just repeats and repeats and repeats. Well, that's not very elegant because you're slamming the batteries with, with excess voltage anyway. Alternately, you could turn on dump loads. So like Bitcoin mining. Bitcoin is a way to convert electricity into money and if you have too much electricity, Bitcoin mining can make sense. I guess that was more popular a year ago, but you know it's hard in the US for us to understand Bitcoin because we have a stable currency. In other countries where they don't have a stable currency, even a shady cryptocurrency looks better than you know Brazilian dollars right now, or Venezuelan rather. And so by using a computer to support the Bitcoin network, you burn a lot of energy and you get paid for it. So, you know, having a Bitcoin miner run when you have surplus energy can work. You know, some extemporaneous. So this is some, some, you know, auxiliary relays to turn on a water fountain so that you're blasting water out of the ground when your batteries are at a full healthy state of charge. That would be another way to do it. You know, a transfer relay <coughs> to turn loads on or off, depending on different triggers. We didn't really talk about, e well, I guess we did talk about equalization yesterday. That's when you're, you're overcharging your lead acid for conditioning. You don't want to do it all the time, but you do it after every few deep discharges. So anyway, Solar Edge makes an inverter that you can tie a lithium ion battery onto. And Solar Edge's inverter is rated to backfeed the grid. Our little Ames inverter, the cheap Chinese inverter, is not listed to backfeed the grid. And so what we'll want to do is put it on a generator interlock switch so that either our grid is on or our Ames inverter is on. Our Ames inverter feeds a 48 volt battery bank. Now our lithium ion battery is a higher voltage battery bank. And the, the real question is, if we have a solar array on the roof, can we use a shared DC bus to charge the lithium ion battery and also to charge the lead acid battery. And the way we would do that is this DC home run on the solar edge system is at about 400 volts. And so we put it, we couple it to a charge controller that's rated for 600 volts and we can share the same DC bus. So we got 48 volts out here to charge up our battery, and we got 380 volts out here to charge up our lithium ion, 
and we got our grid tied battery. And then when there's a power outage, we flick the switch and turn on our lead acid battery. At that time, we may or may not want to keep our solar edge inverter online. And so that would allow you to have your cake and eat it too in terms of having a grid connection for back feed and also having some backup power capability using cheaper stuff. What I think is also intriguing about that is let's say you then said, well, my grid policy has changed and I don't want to keep my grid connection anymore and I still have all this stuff. Well, at that point, you would reprogram your solar edge inverter and instead of it outputting everything onto the grid, instead that electricity will throw, flow through your battery inverter and output everything into your load that way. And so you reprogram your lithium ion inverter, which is a smaller inverter with a smaller battery, and instead of putting it into being the, the master inverter, the one that controls everything, you put it into like they do with commercial projects, where with commercial, you have your load profile and it spikes and then comes back down and it grows and it spikes again and it comes back down at the end of the day. The exact same inverter has a different operating mode where it only cuts the spikes and that's it. So it doesn't try to discharge its entire battery. That lithium ion battery is only being used for spiky loads and what that means is the lead acid battery is being used for longer, flatter, rectangular loads, as it should be, as what will get you to that C20 discharge rate, which will get you longer life, better performance out of your lead acid battery. And so here, just by reprogramming the inverter, we have infrastructure for backfeeding the grid today giving us backup power today and also for converting to off-grid and actually making better use of that lithium ion battery by having a lead acid base and a lithium ion topper so the question is will it work now this kind of explains all that you know what i just said so in the interest of time i'm gonna keep through it so I called Solar Edge. <laughs> At first, I was considering doing this with a Schneider, and we're using a Schneider charge controller, uh, uh, Ames battery inverter, and a Solar Edge battery inverter. <laughs> so I called Schneider and I asked, "Well, you know, can I tap onto a Solar Edge DC bus?" And they're like, um, "I mean, I suppose you could." And then I called Solar Edge and I asked them, they're like, no, you, you're not allowed to. We don't support that. You know, bad things will happen. Um, we're not going to tell you, you know, don't ask us that. That's not, that's not what we do. The question is, well, what happens if you, if you tap a 600 volt charge controller onto a 380 volt shared DC bus that's supposed to be going one way? And instead, you're drawing off power and, and redirecting it another way at the same time. Well, you get into the, the technical details. And what you see is Solar Edge is adjusting the voltage of every single module on that circuit to maintain a constant output of 380 volts. So if one module gets shaded, the other modules decrease their amperage and increase their voltage to maintain that 380 volts. And so what happens is if you draw enough power out of the system, it is equivalent to having, you know, 
a bunch of the modules on the system be shaded or not on. So drawing power off of a shared DC bus can give you the same impact as a shaded solar edge array. But that is why you use those individual voltage regulators on the rooftop behind every module is explicitly to mitigate the impacts of shade so that some of the array can be shaded and the rest of the array can stay on. It used to be that without those things, the whole array would turn off, but you use solar edge to keep the array on. And so a, a, a long story short, Yeah, so long story short, you open up the solar edge spec sheet and it says, okay, if you're using, you know, this product line, you can have between um, let me move that out of the way here. You can have, let's see, rated input over voltage output current you know they, they have a maximum output voltage here we go this is what i wanted you know within a given product line you have a minimum string length and you have a maximum string length so the minimum number of optimizers that will turn on the inverter is eight and the maximum is 25. And so the short of it is you can draw power off of that shared DC bus as long as you're at near the maximum range of the string length and the amount of power that you draw off is no greater than what will get you down to the minimum string length. And if you do any more than that, then it'll turn the system off. But if you stay within that parameter, drawing power off of that shared DC bus is analogous to having shade on the array during that time. And so what we're looking at is you do the math and if you're on a, a fully loaded solar edge circuit, you can draw five kilowatts of power off of that circuit without causing the solar edge array to turn off. So in short, if we put a 4.8 kilowatt charge controller on that shared DC home run, solar edge might not like you very much, but it's still possible. And then you land that on a generator interlock switch. You know, maybe you, you keep this solar edge inverter as a, as a line side tap for the time being, so that when the grid goes down, this inverter comes off, and then you can use your battery backup to power your whole house during an emergency. And then when you're finally ready to cut the grid entirely, you turn on a generator and reprogram your lithium ion inverter, and you get the best of all worlds that way. And that, that concept is called an energy server, where you have where you combine multiple battery chemistries together to obtain an optimal system. And so that's that's kind of what I don't like about the existing battery inverter manufacturers, is they're very interested in keeping you within their own ecosystem, and they're very uninterested in solutions that combine lead acid with lithium ion with supercapacitors and that's a topic we further discuss in our commercial solar peaker class so these are just some notes that you you have that kind of recap that for you and so what i what i like about this is it gives you a doubly redundant system if you're operating off grid without any repeating parts because if your battery inverter main fails you can still operate 
off your smaller lithium ion battery until whatever's wrong with this component goes, you know, comes back online or vice versa without having two lithium ion batteries or two of the same individual component. So I think that that has some value too, and that you achieve some double redundancy without having superfluous parts. And so where I'm at, like in my design with that, is that when, when I'm uh, looking at this house we're doing in Mississippi and looking at a 12 kilowatt inverter and thinking, you know, oh no, maybe we need a little bit more power. You know, I know that down the road, we can just add on a lithium ion inverter to the system to give them that additional power. And, and we're using grid power for now, but as soon as lithium ion pricing begins to drop over the next five years, it'll be a lot cheaper five years from now, 10 years from now than it is today. And so we'll just rate for the opportune moment to add more lithium ion and get the house closer and closer to being off grid. So anyway, I have some pricing here because that's always important. We don't really have time to go through it line item by line item, but it's there so you know. And we're at the end of our class.